Hello and welcome to the Lansdowne online message for Sunday the 14th of October for the evening service. We're continuing our studies in the book of Titus, which we have been going through slowly since the summer. And we're picking up at the end of chapter two. Uh, we'll start with verse 15, but to give some context, I'll read from verse 11. So Titus 2, verse 11, and then we'll read down to chapter 3 and verse 3. So let's hear the word of God. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarrelling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Let's bow in prayer. Father, speak to us now through your word. Lord, give us understanding of what this passage means. Give us uh, the ability to apply through your Holy Spirit to how we live our lives, how we uh, relate to a local church, how we listen to those that you have given to your church to teach us your word. Father, we know that we can get so distracted and we can find excuses not to obey your word. But help us to hear you today. Help me to be clear and help anyone who watches this video or listens to it, Lord, to hear your voice in your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 15 of chapter 2 is very easy to ignore. It's a short verse. It follows uh, uh, behind uh, that, uh, that glorious and well-known passage of verses 11 to 14, which displays for us the glorious gospel. And then again, the first few verses of chapter three are easy to miss because chapter four, but when the kindness, so when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our saviour appeared, he saved us. It's, an, it's another glorious gospel passage. And so it's very easy to miss these important verses because the gospel passages are so glorious. But they're here for a reason, because Titus is the pastor of these churches in Crete. Chapter one, verse five, I left you in Crete that you may put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And Titus in this role that the Apostle Paul has appointed him to needs to be reminded of what his job is. Now, you may be thinking right now, let me just switch this off because I'm not a pastor. And so this is not relevant for me. But actually, all of God's word is relevant. We're all sinners, just like they were in Crete. It's relevant to us because this passage challenges 
the individualism that affects much of the church in our day. Many people, including Christians, want to run their lives with themselves as boss. That no one, be it government, police, teachers, doctors, parents, or even pastors, should be allowed to tell us what's right and wrong. We think we know what's best, and no one is allowed to tell us otherwise. The result that, he, that comes from this is that in many churches, many churches, the pastor's job is seen as keeping people happy. And then some churches go to the opposite extreme, where the pastor simply becomes a dictator. And so we need to have a biblical view of the pastor and by extension to the elders who are responsible for teaching in the local church. This biblical view is seen in three things this passage shows us. Number one, the things we need to hear and the way we need to hear them. Number two, there are things that we need to remember. And then number three, there are things we need to realise. So what do we need to hear? Chapter 2 verse 15 starts with this phrase, declare these things. What are these things? Well, that's why I read from verse 11. These things are the gospel, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. These things include renouncing ungodliness and worldly passions. These things include positively living self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. These things include that eager expectation and waiting for the coming of Christ. These things include recognising the wonder of his redemption. These things include realising we're not just forgiven, but we're redeemed also from the power of sin, the power of lawlessness, and that therefore we are to purify ourselves. These things include recognising we are not our own, but we're a people for his own possession. These things include uh, seeking to be zealous and praying for a Holy Spirit inspired zeal for doing good works. Again, that is chapter 2 and verse 14. These things include what went on earlier in chapter 2 in the first 10 verses, where Titus is told to teach things, sorry, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And he addresses, as we saw a few weeks ago, older men, older women, younger women, younger men, uh, slaves, or in our day, probably employees, and indeed addresses his own behaviour. The heart, then, of the pastor's ministry must be the gospel and its application into all of life. The gospel is so important not just to preach to the world, but to preach to believers so that we don't forget what we've been saved from, so that we don't slip into, on the one hand, legalism. In our zeal for good works, we forget we're saved by, we can forget we're saved by grace. But on the other hand, in marvelling at the amazing grace of God, it's possible for Christians to move into licence. And by that, I mean thinking we can do whatever we want and it doesn't matter because we're saved by grace. And yet in these things laid out for us in verses 11 to 14, we see the answer to both. We see an answer to legalism in the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation. We see the answer to license in it saying training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. It, it, it brings hope because we're waiting for the, the, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so it's absolutely essential we have this gospel grounding. We see both the, the cost, our redemption, the horror of sin and the amazing grace of God. So Titus is verse 15 to declare these things. This has the sense of speaking out in 
uh, as would happen with a pastor preaching, kind of like what I'm doing now. But it also is the, the simply the word for speak or tell. So it's not only the preaching. And a pastor should be able to communicate about Jesus Christ without standing behind a pulpit or, in my case now, sitting in front of a camera. That actually talking about the Lord uh, to the world and in this context to God's people ought to be a natural thing for a pastor. That includes pastoral visitation, hospital visits, fellowship times, that the pastor is able to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, beware a pastor who's merely a professional in the sense that he can do the stuff from the pulpit, but not speak about Jesus outside of it. It's a serious flaw in pastoral ministry, and I exhort myself and encourage you to pray for your pastors that uh, they would be uh, all round in their ministry, not just pulpit ministry, but able to talk about Jesus at other times also. And then as well as declaring, it says, exhort and rebuke with all authority. And these are, are two sides of the coin of being a pastor. To exhort is to come alongside. It, this word he has the same root as the word for uh, the, the comforter, the way the Holy Spirit is described in John 14, the comforter or the counsellor, the helper, the one who comes alongside. And it is the job of the pastor to help, to come alongside, not to need to stand at the front and preach, but to show, to encourage, to comfort, uh, to model by example, to give people practical application of scripture, to help them to live out, to pray for them. How important it is for a pastor to be a, a man of prayer. But also the other side of the coin is to rebuke, that is to correct. It's interesting that the same word is used in uh, John 16 verse 8, where speaking of the Holy Spirit, it says he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So here the, the, the work of the pastor is to be the means by which God brings conviction. The foundation is gospel truth, how it should be lived out in the church, is chapter 2, in the world, which is chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And he needs to be able to challenge and correct when we're getting things wrong. To tell us that that is not the way to live. To be able to rebuke sin, to challenge false teaching. And to correct the way in which we think, to bring a, a challenge where we're being perhaps led by feelings or our circumstances are so overwhelming, we're losing sight of who God is. And so these two come together. There are times when someone needs that coming alongside and encouragement. And there are times when they need a godly um, push and challenge to do what is right when they're doing what is wrong. To be told, no, that is sin. Turn away from it and, and rather turn to uh, the ways that God has given in his word. Now, I would say some pastors are Pastors are often good at either or, depending on their personality. There are those that are very good at confrontation, almost kind of enjoy confrontation, and there are those that are very good at coming alongside, but shun any form of challenging people. It's why we need to pray for pastors to have both, and to encourage our pastors to have both. Now, the foundation by which he teaches 
He declares the gospel and the outworking of the gospel in practical living, that he comes alongside, not is not just to kind of give platitudes, but he comes alongside to help, and he rebukes, not because he's in a bad mood, but with all authority, where does that authority come from? It doesn't come from the pastor throwing his weight around. It comes from faithfully proclaiming the word of God. In chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, At the proper time, God manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Saviour. And the word authority in chapter 2 verse 15 has the same idea. Behind it is command. It is the authority of the pastor it doesn't come simply by being called pastor or vicar or rector or minister or whatever it might be. It comes as he faithfully brings the commands, encouragements, revelation of God Almighty, promises of God Almighty. The authority the pastor has is from the word of God. So he must teach, exhort and rebuke with the authority of God's word only. And that's good news, especially for pastors who don't like confrontation, because actually when you bring a challenge to someone, it must be from the word, not simply just challenging them. And, simp and also for those who are, are inclined to be a comfort and come alongside, it mustn't, as I've said, just be platitudes. It must be the word of God, because that is what is going to bring true comfort, help and encouragement to people. So we need a pastor, what his job is, what we need to hear is the gospel and its application. What we need to hear is the word of God. And there are times it will bring a comfort and encouragement. There are times it will bring a conviction and conviction. And because it's God's word and because it's a pastor's job to bring God's word, Verse 15 ends with this, let no one disregard you. To disregard uh, means to think around a thing. And how it's become translated disregard is when you hear something, you kind of think, well, how can I avoid doing that? How can I avoid listening? How can I uh, kind of get round that? And so it's been translated disregard. The pastor's job is to bring God's word. The job of the pastor himself as he expands the word and the congregation is to listen to God's word and to apply it and to live it out. We must not, therefore, because it's God's word, disregard Think, how can I get around this teaching? How can I get around what the pastor's encouraging me to do? How can I do my own thing? That is to disregard. We can also disregard a pastor because we look at the outward package of maybe the pastor's clothing, the pastor's personality, the pastor's haircut, or whatever it might be. Or in my case, as you probably look at my hands waving around all over the screen, the pastor's mannerisms and we can say oh goodness he's going off again oh he's saying this again and we disregard him we criticize him we look at his wife we look at his kids we look at his pets my dear brother uh, who used to be an elder here referred to a, a, a criticism a pastor received once because his dog bit the postman and so somehow the pastor's dog needed to be super spiritual and not bite postman now, brothers and sisters, let's not look at things we can pick and complain about our pastors. Let's honour them. 
let's listen to what they say to us from God's word. Let's apply what they say from God's word. Let's obey the word of God through them. And those times when the pastor may go astray and, 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 and not apply God's word is a time when the leadership gather around and encourage him and draw him back to God's word. But pulling down, criticising, thinking around, how can I undermine and get rid of and nullify this pastor's ministry is not the way of local church. We need godly pastors. That's the first thing. It's taken me longer uh, than I planned. So let's hurry on now to the next chapter. So the pastor uh, declare, exhort, rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. Now chapter 3 verse 1, remind. So these are things we need to remember. So Titus is to teach the church the gospel. He's to encourage and challenge. He's to apply as laid out in verses 1 to 10 of chapter 2. But also he is to help them live in a falling world, fallen world, by reminding them. Because so often we forget how it is to, we are to live. There is a pressure of living in the world that can incline us either to become like the world or to hate the world and to constantly complain about living in this terrible world around. Now, bearing in mind Paul talks here about submission and obedience and good works and not speaking evil, not quarrelling and so on, we just need to remind ourselves of the kind of society this church was or these churches were in. Here is chapter one and verse 12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts and lazy gluttons. So the society that Paul is now wants Titus to, to, to teach about how we behave in is not a very good society. It's not like a nice, genteel, Christian loving society. It's a God hating society, perhaps very much like our own. Now, Jesus in John chapter 17 and verses 15 and 16 in his high priestly prayer said this, John 17, 15 and 16. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So we are to be in the world, not to be taken out of the world, but we're not to be of the world. And so the job of the past is to bring back to mind, perhaps what Paul has already taught in the past, to bring back to mind how we're to relate to the society, how we're to live as citizens of the world. We are, firstly, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. So it has a sense of the rulers, those with the overall rule and the authorities being those who implement their decisions. So in our context, that would include uh, local government and police officers and so on, who those who have authority in local areas, even teachers uh, in, in schools. And this is seen in obedience. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient. Now, of course, this is, a, this is very difficult in a day when there are many ungodly laws. Now, our first responsibility is to obey God. But God has commanded us to obey the authorities. So, uh, while there's not time to go into vast detail, Roman, Romans chapter 13, let every authority, sorry, sorry, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. And then in 1 Peter, So that's 2 Peter, I'm turning up the wrong book. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. 
be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to be to the emperors, to supreme, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Behind this uh, statement of Paul here, Romans 12, sorry, Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2, is our witness in the world. We are not rebellious, ungodly citizens. Like so many today are so angry with our government. We're to be respectful and good citizens and only disobey when there is direct contradiction of the command of the authorities against the word of God. For example, to be told not to preach the gospel will be a direct challenge to God's word. And only under those circumstances may we disobey. And the idea of the word is of willing obedience, which itself is a challenge. Do we willingly obey the speed limit? Do we willingly pay our taxes? Do we willingly pray for our government? Or do we try and cut corners? It also speaks here in verse 1 of being ready, of being ready for all good works, of looking out how can we do good in our society. Again, to link to 1 Peter chapter 3, to this time chapter 3, to be always prepared or ready, same word, to give a reason for the hope that is within us. So, and, very, and those two verses can go together in that as we seek to serve our society, get involved, help our neighbours, take care of older people, support local charities, get involved in local schools. As we do those good works, then it creates opportunity for people to ask us for the hope that we have within us. But this is hard, so we need pastors to remind us of these things. And then in verse 2, it moves on in general terms to our attitudes to people and the way we speak to them. And again, it's so easy to get angry and frustrated like the world around. So it says, verse two, speak evil of no one. Now, speak evil, uh, some translations say slander. Uh, the, the Greek word is, is where we get the word blasphemy, to speak against people. And often we speak against our rulers. I don't know myself talking about Boris Johnson and, and, and not necessarily just disagreeing with him. That's fine to say, well, maybe he should be doing this or that instead. To say, this is wrong that they're doing. That is fine, but it's actually an attack upon him as a person. It's not to be a part of our conduct, attacks upon our neighbours and friends. It says, not avoid quarrelling, fighting. Uh, we should be peaceable in our speech. We should be gentle. That is reasonable, considerate, bearing with other people. And then carry on in the verse to show perfect courtesy. Now, some translations have this as gentleness, whereas uh, where it says to be gentle in the ESV, it says be considerate. Well, uh, these words overlap, but this word that the ESV translates courtesy or all courtesy is that inward attitude of gentleness. It's the same word as there in Galatians 5.23, for the fruit of the Spirit. It's not, it's a meekness, not a weakness. It's not always giving in when things are wrong, but it's submissive to God. It's showing the character of, of Christ who is meek and lowly of heart. It's not self-promotion or self-serving but honouring others out of delight for Christ. These things are a challenge, which is why God appoints pastors to teach the gospel, to come alongside and to rebuke. There is huge pressure from the world and it's so easy to blend in. 
So we, we need to be reminded of how to live in the world as though by those God has appointed to shepherd the flock. And against the other extreme, we need to avoid that anger, that hatred, that frustration with the world that manifests in being awkward citizens and not godly citizens. Brothers and sisters, there's enough to alienate people in the gospel itself without us alienating them by our behaviour and our speech. Let's address the manner of our speech and behaviour. Let's listen to God's word. Let's hear what godly pastors teach about our responsibility living in this world and not disregard these things and go our own way. So we need to hear the gospel and its application. We need to remember our position as in but not of the world, but very much in it, living for God's glory in our attitudes and our speech in the world. But then finally, we need to realise something. And while verse 3 links very much to the, the next section that we'll look at in a few weeks' time, it is linked to what's gone before, because there is the word for. Verse 3, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Doesn't make pleasant reading. Say, I'm not like that. Well, it's essentially giving us an insight into the condition of our hearts before we knew Christ. Not that we did everything in this list, but this is the heart of the unbeliever and the potential for all of these things to manifest themselves either in part or all consuming in a life that's disconnected from the Lord. When we uh, say uh, we ourselves were once foolish disobedient, that's the, the, as it were, the root. This morning, in this morning's message, if you've heard that one on Revelation uh, 20 and 21, in Revelation 21, it warns about the cowardly and unbelieving. That is those who were, uh, don't have the courage to stand out from the world and put their trust in Jesus, who will be unbelieving to blend in with the world. And then that leaves, leads to all kinds of other behaviours. And the same thing is true here. Foolishness is an ignorance of God. A, a blindness and not understanding God and his ways. And of course, we saw uh, uh, when I preached a couple of weeks ago on 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. And this is just what then means we become disobedient to God. And we used to live in a particular way without regard for God and his word. And then that, in turn uh, accumulates with uh, being led astray or being deceived, being carried by uh, passion and pleasures where happiness becomes God rather than God himself. And for happiness to be God is uh, to be enslaved. And so then we think evil of others. We become envious of others and whole relationships break down. I will unpack this a little bit more next time because actually one of the reasons this is here is to show the wonder of the gospel because then the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared. That's verse 4, chapter 3, verse 4. How amazing, the light of what we're like. But it's also here to remind us that we're just, we were just like the world. So let's show grace to the world. But it's also here in the context of this sermon. It's here to remind us of what we once, were once like. And therefore to remind us of the battle we still face against sin. And again, this is why 
we need godly pastors who will faithfully teach us God's word. Because firstly, we need to understand the gospel of grace and how that gospel is lived out. And that's chapter two. And so there are times when we we, we need to be rebuked because we're not living in line with God's will. We've not got the gospel properly. We need to be rebuked and corrected. There are times where we need that exhortation the pastor coming alongside us and helping us and lovingly and tenderly applying God's word we need a pastor because there's an outward battle the world will have us conform and we either conform like the world wants us to or we overreact by that and of hatred and anti-world and separation from the world so that we become completely useless in terms of our witness to the world. And remember what we we pointed out a few weeks ago, chapter 2 and verse 10, that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of our God and Saviour. So that's that outward battle. So we need godly pastoral ministry to help us. But then there's the inward battle, which is what chapter three, verse three shows us. By looking back to where we came from, we need to realize that there's still a battle. In the morning message, uh, uh, Revelation 21, verse seven, it says, to the one who conquers. And we talk about overcoming. There is a battle against sin. We are new creations, but there is still indwelling sin. And so we need both a comfort for when we do sin, that there is grace, Lord, that, 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 that we, we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ and the rebuke of God's word to call us away from sin because we have that constant warfare within us. And so we need pastors. We need to put ourselves in the way of pastoral teaching. And from some of the comments I've had or messages that have been passed to me, I know that some of you are listening to these messages and you're not yet part of a church. Actually, to live the Christian life, we need to be involved in a local church. I'd love you to come to Lansdowne if you're local, but I don't really mind as long as you're going to a godly church where God's word is faithfully taught because it's essential to healthy Christian living. If you live far away, start visiting churches until you find one where there is good, sound exposition and application of sacred scripture. Not just nice thoughts, but the truth, the gospel, and how it applies to our lives. I mean, as I close, can I encourage you to pray for your pastor or the one you're going to have when you settle into a local church? You pray the pastor would do what he does with all authority. That means he needs to be a pastor grounded in the word and not distracted and he needs to teach the whole counsel of God and not just his favourite passages pray for your pastor's teaching pray for his godliness chapter 2 and verse 7 talking to Titus himself Paul says show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned. Pray for his godliness. Pray, thirdly, for his gentleness and compassion. Again, chapter 2, verse 15, exhort. Remember we said that means coming alongside to help. Pray for his gentleness. But also, fourthly, pray for the courage for him to speak boldly, firmly, when that is needed. Exhort and 
rebuke. Fifthly, pray with thankfulness that God has given pastoral ministry to the church. And then three things for ourselves. Chapter 3, verse 3. Thank God for what you've been saved from. And recognise your battle with sin. Second thing to pray for yourself. Pray that you would listen and respond and not do what the end of verse 15 says. Do not disregard God's minister or the word he brings. And thirdly for yourself, pray that you would live as a godly citizen as outlined in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3 and so display the glorious gospel. Let us now do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and I pray now for my own ministry and the ministry of Lansdowne and the, my fellow pastors for anybody from other churches who are listening to this message today. Father, would you help us to be faithful to teach your word? You help us to be godly, gentle and bold. And Father, would you help all your people not to disregard your word, to listen and respond, to be thankful, so thankful for what we've been saved from and to be in response to your word, fierce in our battle against indwelling sin. But Lord, may we to the world around, may we not be like them, but may we instead be loving and gentle, avoid quarrelling. May we be meek, may we not be rebellious, but be godly citizens display the glory of Christ to those around and may we experience what the apostle Peter talks about the people come and ask us for a reason for the hope that is within us these things we ask in Jesus name amen amen may the Lord bless you and encourage you and challenge you through this word thank you for listening